Sunday, Monday, happy days. Tuesday, Wednesday, happy days. Thursday, Friday, happy days. Saturday, what a day. Rock it all week with you. These days are on. Won't you be mine? These days are on. Oh, please be mine. Hey, everybody, what great worship, and I hope you're encouraged to say those words. Yes, I will, Lord. I'm going to claim your promises. I'm going to believe they're true. You know, I wear my, I wear my shirt that uh, Elton John or Liberace mail me. I don't know. Somebody mail me. But uh, I just want to keep your attention today. You know, we had a great Easter, an unbelievable Easter weekend. If you didn't get to hear what I shared, I'll talk about it at the end of the service. Grace Church continues to blow my mind. The walls of this ministry have never held us back from accomplishing God's purposes, but that's never been more true than it is now. You know, we're following God's commands to be strong and courageous, to not be afraid, to move forward. You know, rather than being worried about what could or might happen, knowing that God's in control of what will happen. And so I just want to encourage you. I want you to know that. You know, we had a great time. We had uh, our, our family's been in quarantine, so we were able to do a little Easter egg hunt with the grandkids. And I was mentioning to the media team a little while ago that when you get to be my age, you don't really need to uh, hide the Easter eggs from the kids. You can just hide them from yourself. You go outside, you hide them, wait 30 minutes. I can't remember where I put them. I mean, kids were out there looking for the eggs, and I'm like, uh, I, I think I put them over here. I don't even know. You know, it's just terrible when you get to be older. But uh, it was a great Easter weekend, and I'm looking forward to today because today we're going to continue our series, Happy Days. And Happy Days, last weekend, we, we had the Easter weekend, and the service was, oh, happy day, because it was the happiest day in history when Jesus conquered death and hell. You might think that today's message at least the title would have been more appropriate for last weekend, but I saved it. I saved it for the story of my favorite person in the Bible apart from Jesus Christ himself, and that's a guy named Joseph. And Joseph's life was all about the comeback. And happiness is all about the comeback. And I know you're feeling just the way I am, that it is time to move forward. It is time to get out and and, and really get back to some kind of normalcy. And I think there's going to have to be a level of faith and trust in God and not the government and not even all the amazing healthcare professionals. But I think there's going to have to be a level of saying, you know what, God, we're going to trust you to protect, to bring immunity, to do some things. And, and I'm hoping that that time is going to be soon. We've heard it uh, from the, the president, and we need to pray for our president. I don't care what political side you're on. We need to be praying for our president, for Congress, for people in, in positions of authority right now, because it is overwhelming. I'm going to tell you, just as a pastor in a ministry, and as large as our ministry is, it has been overwhelming for me, for the elders, for the team. And in many respects, there are a few of us that are able to do what we do and the rest of the staff really supporting from their homes. But it can get stressful. I can't even imagine what it's like to oversee 330 million people during a pandemic and not a local one, not a national one, but a global one. So let's continue to pray. Let's trust God and know that he's going to do a great work because, guys, happiness is all about the comeback. Of course, the greatest comeback in history was Jesus Christ conquering death. But thousands of years before Jesus invaded humanity, Jesus has always been, he's fully God, he's always existed, and he always will. But before he was incarnate and died and rose again, there was a guy named Joseph. And Joseph was what we oftentimes refer to as a, as a, a precursor of Christ. He was a picture of Jesus in the Old Testament. During this time, uh, Egypt was the world ruling power. And the nation of Israel had not even really come about. As a matter of fact, his father uh, would really become the father of Israel. His name would be Israel. And through his 12 sons, he would raise up uh, a mighty nation that has existed for all these thousands and thousands of years. 
But this story of Joseph is an incredible story. Now, I didn't know all the stories in the Bible. Uh, when I was a kid, my parents became believers when I was about eight years old. So I didn't know anything about Jesus, anything about the Bible. And I remember one day, my dad brought me a little comic book. And they used to make these Christian comic books. And uh, I think they probably still do. And he gives it to me. And it was this really cool guy on the front page. Now, you got to remember, this is like 1973 or 74. And, and uh, he's standing in a really cool suit in front of a, you know, 1974 Corvette and he's got a jet plane behind him and it it's called Joe uh, and his crazy coat or something like that and so I remember reading this story going wow this guy's really cool and then all of a sudden he gets falsely accused and he's thrown in prison he loses everything and I'm really feeling bad for this guy well that next weekend Literally, my parents took us to church, we went to this little Baptist church in town, right over here on, it's now on 70 uh, or 80th in Lowell, but it used to be on 72nd in Bradburn or 77th in Bradburn. It's First Southern Baptist Church of Westminster. And we went over there and my teacher at the time was this sweet, precious lady named Kay Stoner. Uh, and she was an amazing woman. I remember going in the class, there's about five or six other kids. And I don't know what her plan was for the day, but she asked if we had seen anything cool that week or experience. So I told about my comic book. I said, oh, he has this really cool story about this guy who's the youngest brother of, of 11 other older brothers and he lost everything and she's kind of smirking the whole time. And she goes, well, Ricky, that's what they call me at that age, that's the story of Joseph from the Bible. And she set aside whatever she was planning to do and she told us, took us back to Genesis 37 and told us the story of Joseph. And it was such an amazing experience. I'm like, wow, that's in the Bible? And it really began at a very young age for me that I began to see that the Bible is the most powerful thing on earth and that it has life-changing truth. And, and I, I believed and accepted what I know now to be true, that these Bibles, Bible stories are absolute truth. And in the midst of this, there was much to be learned. And one of the greatest lessons I learned from that story way back, and I continue it today, is you can't have a comeback without a setback. You can't have a comeback without a setback. Guys, this pandemic has been a global setback. I was trying to explain this to somebody I loved in my family not long ago, and, and it was hard for him to really grasp this. I think it's really hard the younger you are to go, wait a second, the world has just stopped literally operating and it has and and there's a lot of questions coming to me I'm trying to answer those during my question and answers on Tuesdays and Wednesdays so please join me uh, for those I'll be talking about prophecy the next couple of weeks but but in the midst of it only God knows the real answer but I do know this that we're going to have a comeback and that comeback isn't just going to be a national comeback it's going to be a global comeback but more importantly it's going to be the comeback of the church. It's going to be the comeback of the church. We're going to come back and we're going to have a platform we haven't had in maybe decades, maybe since World War II, maybe since 9-11. That's probably the last time this country was shook to its core. And now we have lost not just 3,000, I don't mean just, or even the, the thousands more that died in the war to follow. But we have lost tens of thousands. And it's, it's scary what's happening. But God says you can't have a comeback without a setback. Now, let me just share this with you before we jump into the story of Joseph. Because I really want to focus our attention on these chapters in Genesis chapter 37 to 39. Now, this story goes all the way to Genesis 50 and the conclusion of the book. But I'm going to sum it up more today. You'll see some of the passages. Get your outline. You can get it there on your, your uh, you know, mobile device of any kind. But just pay attention. You can always go back, fill in the blanks later. You can write this stuff down, but I really, more importantly, want you to get the application from this story because you can't have a comeback without a setback. You know, there's three guarantees about a setback that we need to really just kind of establish uh, as, a, as a forerunner to this message. First of all, setbacks actually set up comebacks. Setbacks actually set up comebacks. I mean, probably if you're a Bronco fan, I'm a Denver Bronco fanatic, 
you can remember when John Elway led the Broncos in the drive against uh, the Cleveland Browns. And it used to be that I just remembered that memory through the 80s and 90s and 2000s. Now you can watch it all the time. And I have multiple times because I still remember sitting there watching John Elway drive the Broncos 98 yards, throw that pass to Mark Jackson and, and really have that, that uh, amazing miracle comeback. And then eventually over time and we win and we go to the Super Bowl. But that was an amazing comeback. But the really cool story is Keith Bishop, who was one of the linemen at the time, Went back in the huddle. The Broncos got the ball. They had somewhere around four or five minutes left, and they got the ball on their own two-yard line. And Keith Bishop looked at the team, and before Elway called the play, he said this, hey, guys, we got them right where we want them. I want to say this. We got them right where we want them. You know who I'm talking about? The enemies of evil, the forces in darkness, a supernatural world that wants to destroy and kill and wreck our lives. And God says, hey, you got to come back. It's coming. Because setting up a comeback is what setbacks do. You know what else? Setbacks actually prepare my character for my comeback. If we allow them to, they prepare our character. If we don't allow these moments to grow our character and our faith, then they paralyze our comeback. Some of us may not be at this point in the best mindset, the best headspace we've been in. We may not be as patient with the kids. We may not be as loving toward our spouse. We may not be embracing this moment. It, it saddened me the other day when I saw that domestic violence is at an all-time high across this country, that, that ch child abuse is at an all-time high across this country which says that most of the danger and the, the suffering that comes in families comes from a spouse, it comes from a parent. Guys, you're not being set up for a great comeback. You're being paralyzed by sin and by evil and by the evil one. And so I want us to, to step back and see that setbacks actually prepare our character. Are we spending time? I'll show you how we can spend time preparing our character. And then finally, setbacks actually guarantee a promising hope for the future. Now, you know, I, I'm seeing all these things. Bill Gates is saying, not good. All this stuff that the economists are saying, not great. All the stuff that, you know, president or Congress, because they're all speaking out of both sides of their mouth at times. Listen, I only care what God has to say. And God says this, I am promising my people a great future, a guaranteed future. Not only do we have hope, not only do we have hope and a promise of heaven, but we can experience God's joy right now because it doesn't depend on our circumstances. And we see that in this amazing story. Now listen, Joseph was extraordinary. And before I tell you about Joseph, I want you to understand something. Joseph was an optimist. He had to be maybe the greatest optimist to ever lived. You know, an optimist sees the positive in things and the pessimist sees the negative in things. As a matter of fact, the pessimist sees problems in the possibilities, but the optimist sees possibilities in the problems. Are you seeing possibilities in the problems? Are you seeing possibilities for your family, for your community? Are you dreaming of ways that when you come out, you can make a difference in your neighborhood? Are you longing for that opportunity? Because I believe God's allowing this to happen to the church and to each of us so we develop a passion for others. You're saying, yeah, but we won't even be able to shake hands or hug or, or really talk to people within six feet. I don't believe that for a second. I don't believe that God created us to be together only to wipe that out forever. That's not going to happen. You mark my words right now. God is going to provide a way that we can love one another. The pessimist sees problems in the possibilities. The optimist sees possibilities in the problems. And I want to be that optimist. You know, that guy, Joseph, in the Old Testament was an optimist. And it started at a very young age for him. You know, I think in some ways, Joseph may have experienced a longer life of setbacks than Job did. You know, Job was a guy in the Bible, and I'll preach on him in a couple weeks, that lost everything in just a few hours. 
And then he suffered, not understanding why. And then he came out of it in a miraculous way. But Joseph went through 13 years of setbacks. You know, I, I have said this many times that, that our instant response, like Job, who said, God, you've taken all 10 of my children, all my riches, everything. Naked came I into this world. Naked will I leave. It was an amazing response, but it was also a response that was partially wrapped up in shock. I see that with people that lose loved ones. You know, we have had three tragic deaths in this ministry. And we have seen some of the most horrific stuff happen. Even a murder of a 20-year-old girl. Please pray for the Sepulvedas, for Jennifer and Marcos. Pray for the Camachos. Pray for the Kleins. But in the midst of all of this, death will continue to run its course. It's how we respond to it. You know, when, when the numbness wears off in a person's life and they, they, they stop saying what Job said, then the real feelings come out. Like, God, where are you? Why have you allowed this? I can't go on without this person. And those are the moments when you really have to get back to God's promises. And we're going to look at that. So let me just explain real quick before we look at how to overcome uh, the setbacks in our life. Let's look at the seven setbacks of Joseph. Now, Joseph was the youngest at that point of the 12 sons of Jacob. He was the youngest. And Joseph was passionate about doing what God wanted from a young age. And Joseph had a gift. He could, he could interpret dreams. And before God's word was complete, God spoke to many of his people and prophets through dreams. And Joseph had dreams. And his dreams were dreams of ruling the world. Now, a lot of young people, maybe young men, young women, dream of ruling the world. In Joseph's case, it was going to happen. But he didn't have a lot of discretion in his teen years. I mean, who of us really did? I know I didn't. And so Joseph began to share that. And in the midst of sharing that, he is also, the Bible tells us, his father wasn't a really wise person because he loved Joseph more than all of his other sons. Because Joseph came from the wife that he really was passionate about. Now, this is a really bad thing. If you're a parent, you should never love another child more than the other. But in Joseph's case, this started his life with a lot of problems. If your older brothers all hate you, you can have a miserable life. Then on top of it, if it wasn't enough that his father actually said, I love Joseph most, he made him a coat. That was like made of many colors and had a sign on the back that said, please beat me up. Well, it didn't, but that's really what it was saying to all of his brothers. And they just got more and more angry until eventually they sold him into slavery and told his dad he'd been killed by a wild animal. Now, I want to show you the seven setbacks of Joseph real quick. First of all, his first setback is he was coddled and lived a charmed childhood. You can look these verses up later, but you heard it. God uh, blessed him with a, with a gift, but his father was giving him exception over his siblings. That isn't a good thing. Some of us say, oh, yeah, I've, just, I've done everything for my child, and they just have everything they want, and I'm just their good friend. And I never discipline them. I don't punish. I don't. That's not good. That's creating a problem for you that's going to multiply into a troubled adult. And so in this moment, Joseph's a godly young man. Thank God he was. But he was coddled, and that was his first setback. You know what else? His brothers were jealous and hated him. That's a setback. Some of you have people that are jealous of you, or they hate you, and you really don't have anything to do with it. But others brag and boast and tell people how great they are, and hey, love me and worship me, or maybe they have other people do it and they don't stop them. And, and, and you have people that are jealous and hate you. That was the situation with Joseph. You know what else his next setback was? He was sold into slavery, and when the Ishmaelites took Joseph, you see, his brothers wanted to kill him. Judah wanted him dead, but Reuben said, no, let's not kill him. We don't get any money. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelite traders. And they would take Joseph 110 miles from his homeland into Egypt, the world ruling power at this time. Now, guys, 110 miles today with a car, 
is like a couple hours. 110 miles thousands and thousands of years ago was like weeks and even months. It may as well have been the moon. And he was sold into slavery. You know what his next setback was? He was purchased by the captain of Pharaoh and was the least important slave the moment he was purchased. When Potiphar bought Joseph, uh, history tells us, and I love Egyptology, I've studied it a lot, uh, there were probably anywhere from 10 to 50 servants in the household of this commander, Potiphar. And when you are purchased, when you were purchased thousands of years ago, you were the least important. So Joseph came in and he had to prove himself from the very beginning. So now he goes from top dog brother to sold into slavery to now the bottom of the barrel as far as slaves are concerned. And then he starts to grow in his reputation with Potiphar. Potiphar sees something and the Bible expresses it this way. The Lord made Joseph successful in everything he did. So everything's going great. Now he's put in charge of all of Potiphar's home and land and servants. Amazing. We don't know exactly how long that took. We do know that all of these setbacks took 13 years. Then what happens? He's tempted on a daily basis by Potiphar's gorgeous wife. Now I'm going to throw in gorgeous for this reason. Women in those days who were captains or rulers or Pharaoh's wives were literally unblemished. They were beautiful. And every day she was tempting him. Listen, any red-blooded American man who isn't committed to Christ, who's being tempted day in and day out by a very promiscuous woman is eventually going to face their sexuality in a way they never dreamed. Joseph took that temptation every single day. That was a setback. You know what else? He resisted. He said no, and he was falsely accused of rape, lost everything, and falsely imprisoned. He did the right thing. Guys, some of you right now are doing all the right things. Some of you were flying high in your job. Some of you were killing it in in your college education. Some of you were in high school getting ready to graduate. My heart is broken for everyone who is working so hard. And you were just soaring. And this was all ripped out from underneath you. And you're angry and you're frustrated. And I totally get it. I do. My heart breaks for you. But God has a reason. And if you trust him, he will take even the worst situation and make great things happen. Joseph was falsely accused of rape. Everything he had was taken away and he was falsely imprisoned. Now, I gotta be honest. At this point, I've been beaten. I've been thrown in a well. I've been sold to slaves. I've become a slave. I climbed the the corporate ladder of slaves and became the top dog slave. Now I'm falsely accused and thrown into prison. I think at this point, I'm at my breaking point. I'm just going, God, I, I, I don't know if I can take another setback. Some of you are at that breaking point. God, I, I just got that job and I lost it. I, I don't know if I can take another setback. I want you to know something you can. And I'm going to show you how in a minute. He was forgotten and betrayed by Pharaoh's cupbearer. Here's what happens. He's in prison. He climbs. <laughs> this is amazing. He becomes such a great prisoner that the prison guard in charge of the whole prison gives him the keys and puts him in charge. Literally, the Bible says the same thing. The, the, the man, the jailer, saw that the Lord was with Joseph and made everything he did succeed. That's said seven times in Genesis about Joseph. I'll explain that in a minute. He gives him the keys. Now Joseph is in charge. He's doing a great job. He's overseeing the prison. And then the cupbearer and the baker of Pharaoh uh, get in prison. Probably made a bad cake and some bad wine. And they have dreams. Joseph interprets the dreams. One's going to be put back, the cupbearer. The other's going to be killed. It happens just as he said. And before the cupbearer goes back, he says, can you please remember me with Pharaoh and tell him I'm falsely accused and, and please help me get out of here? He forgets him. Isn't it just like people, you help them, you love them, they forget you. I see that a lot in ministry. You help people, you care for them, and then later they're just like, yeah, oh, I, you know, I don't even remember what church helped me. And yet they could be a part of helping others. And then eventually the greatest, greatest setback 
Being betrayed and forgotten became the greatest story of a comeback. Look at Psalm 105. I'm going to jump into a passage that many of you probably wouldn't think of if you're talking about Joseph, but look at this in Psalm 105 because it sums it all up, and then we'll look at how to make the best comeback from a setback. But he sent a man on ahead, Joseph, sold as a slave. They put cruel chains on his ankles and iron around his neck. Until God's word came to Pharaoh. That, just, that statement, God's word came to Pharaoh, just summed up 13 years of what I just told you. And God confirmed his promise. God sent the king to release him. The Pharaoh set Joseph free. He appointed him master of his palace. Put him in charge of all his business to personally instruct his princes and train his advisors in wisdom. Whoa! I mean, right here in the book of Psalms, 13 years of his life is all summed up in just a couple of verses. So how did Joseph demonstrate to us a pathway to extraordinary comebacks? Well, he gives us six principles. And I, man, guys, if we can get these today, we are going to be prepared for the greatest comeback in the history of the world. That's not an exaggeration. It is a fact. And the first way that Joseph's pathway to an extraordinary comeback is demonstrated, and, and I'll share it with you this way, is that we need to, to develop an ability to discern. And I'm using Joseph's name to, to give you an acrostic to remember. And the first thing you do, uh, the word judge is also the word discern. You judge between God's plan and God's preparation. Now, they can be the same thing. But right now, we are definitely in God's preparation time. He's weeding out certain things in our lives. He's tightening up certain areas in our lives. Whether that's our hygiene, whether it's our spiritual life, whether it's our health. Some of us got more serious about our immune system than ever before. So he's tightening up areas in our life if we allow him to. You've got to be able to discern between God's plan and God's preparation. Yes, God has a plan for all of this. God's plan cannot be stopped. But I believe, just like Joseph, we're in a time of preparation. Look at Genesis 37, 9 real quick. Soon Joseph had another dream, and again he told his brothers about it. Listen, I've had another dream, he said. The sun, moon, and 11 stars bowed before me. Not a good choice, Joseph. Think about it. You go tell your older brothers the first day that them and their father are going to bow to you. The next day, you tell them that the sun and the moon are going to bow to you. Now, I'm just going to tell you something. Those dreams came true. Joseph became second in command of all the world. Egypt was the superpower. It was the global power. And he became second in command of Pharaoh. But you don't go out and brag about that. You've got to learn to be discreet. So in this time, right now, you can be confident that God is using this to bring about his plan. This pandemic is part of God's plan, his master plan. I know that doesn't make sense when people are dying and lives have been hurt, but everybody's dying. We're eventually going to die. And it's where we go that matters most, heaven or hell. So judge between God's plan and God's preparation. Some of you are like, ooh, haven't even thought about this as preparation time. It is preparation time. It's time to prepare your families. It's time to sink your, your, your family's focus into the word of God. It's time to, to get excited about serving in ministry when we can finally come back together and to be doing that right now. To be generous with your time, your talent, and your treasure. That time is now. It's not later. And this is God's preparation. It was God's preparation for Joseph because as God was revealing to him supernaturally that he would one day rule the world, he was getting beaten up and thrown into a well and sold into slavery. We're getting beaten up by this pandemic, but we will not be knocked out. We are more than conquerors. The second pathway to extraordinary comebacks is obey God's purpose rather than my selfish passions. You know, in Joseph's story, he is tempted day in and day out by this beautiful wife of Potiphar. And no doubt she's saying things like, he'll never know. 
Come and sleep with me. I'll never tell anybody. I love you. You're gorgeous. You're amazing. I want you to pay attention to Joseph's response. Look at this. The Lord was with Joseph. So he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. And Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her. You guys pay close attention. My master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? Everybody look at this. Read it out loud at home. It would be a great sin against who? God. See, Joseph's standard wasn't, oh man, Potiphar will really get mad at me. Man, I can't do this because Potiphar might, you know, lose his cool and, and stick a sword through my chest. He didn't say any of that. He said, I can't do this because it's a sin against God. Joseph's standard wasn't based on man's principles. It was based on God's purposes. For us, it should not determine. This pandemic, the government, should not determine our purposes. They are to love God, their worship, their fellowship, their discipleship and ministry and mission. Those are our purposes. And that's what we have to be focused on today. There's absolutely no way in the world that when we obey our own selfish passions, anything good comes from it. You just talk to anybody in your life who has said, yeah, I let my lust get in the way. Well, that's a lust for another person, a lust for money, for stuff. Any Christian who's honest would say, that's where my problems began. You know, I had an opportunity. I was never the greatest musician. I'm still not. I was never the greatest vocalist, nothing. I just worked hard. And I had a band, and we, we had some success. And in the early 90s, there was a musician named Ray Boltz, and he was very popular. As a matter of fact, back in those days, the most popular. And he was selling out arenas. And at that time, he'd asked us to become his band, myself and Adam, a few other guys. And my wife was, had just stepped out of the band, was taking care of our kids as I was doing the church and music. And, and so we had a chance to sign with a major label and tour. And I remember going home and telling my wife this, and she said, you can't do this. You have a church, you have a family, you have a wife. And I remember in the moment thinking that all my dreams had been shattered, that I could manage all of this. And when I said no, it was very painful but it was the most important decision I ever made at that point in my life. And God used it to show me, Rick, this isn't about your selfish passions. This is about my purpose for you. I always thought I'd be doing that, but this is what he wanted me to do. Obey his purposes. Third, stay calm because God has a plan that cannot be stopped. God's plan cannot be stopped. It can't. As a matter of fact, in Genesis 39, verse 21, it says this, but the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Guys, not even jail can stop the favor of God. If you're God's child, and I'm assuming that if you're watching, you're either concerned, uh, maybe thinking about becoming a child of God, or you are a child of God. And if any of those are, are, are true in your life, God's plan cannot be stopped in your life. He cannot be stopped. Not even prison can stop it. You know, when we fall into the temptations of our own desires and passions and we start feeling sorry for ourselves, really bad things happen. You know what God has to do? He has to get our attention. But here's something else. Sometimes... We're doing just about everything right. We're honoring God in about every way we possibly can. And bad things still happen. Bad things happen to good people. Yes, it's a broken planet. That's why. And yes, this is not our home. And no, we are not here to get all we can and can all the rest or, or can the rest and, 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 and poison everything else. We are here to glorify God and live for his purposes. 
And when you start to recognize that, when we start to understand that, God gets our attention. And we need to stay calm because God cannot be stopped. And if we're not calm in those moments, he'll calm us down. You know, I had a situation two years ago where in the first time in 33 years of ministry, I took a sabbatical for eight weeks. It's the first time I've ever done anything like that. And, and I was feeling kind of sorry for myself because it was in intense eight weeks and it wasn't as restful as I thought. We finally took some time to go camping. We came back and I was outside getting some of my camping gear. I was walking under my trailer and um, I had been arguing with my wife and we both got really heated. And she was in the kitchen at the sink uh, washing dishes and I was carrying this big grill. It's a heavy, uh, you know, griddle really, about a hundred pounds. And I I'm mad. I'm just, and I reach down, I grab it. And I'm ducking under my trailer. And as I come out, my slide out is out and I hit it. The whole metal just rips right down my face. And I mean, it cut me good. It knocked me cold. I fell to the ground when I came to just moments later, my, my arms were underneath the griddle. They were sore and I was bleeding. I couldn't see out of my left eye. I just knew when I turned around with my good eye, my eyeball was going to be on the corner of that metal. It wasn't, but it was cut from here all the way down my face. So I, I stumble. I, I, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever been knocked cold before. I have a number of times. And I'm kind of stumbling up to the patio and I go, honey. And she doesn't even want to look up. She's still mad at me. I'm like, honey, I just hit my face. And she's like, oh, she comes running out. And she sits me down. She cleans me up. And we start talking. We're both very peaceful and apologetic and I go back out and I just sit down next to my, my fence and I'm just like, okay, God, you got my attention. I'm selfish. I was worried about me. I thought this whole time was just about me finally. This is going to be Rick time because it's always been everybody else's time and, and that's wrong. It's always your time, God. It's always your plan. You know, stay calm. Because God's plan cannot be stopped. And if you can't stay calm, he will calm you down. And I would much rather just obey him than get knocked upside the head again. <laughs> Guys, you're in the midst of a situation right now. None of us can help uh, this situation. No, life is not going on as normal for anyone in the world. And yes, I do think there's a divine conspiracy behind this. I don't think, of, I'm not talking about the Illuminati or the chip that Bill Gates has created or any of that stuff. It could all be a part of the future plan. I'm talking about a divine plan where God is using these times to bring more people to salvation. In Joseph's life, he's in prison, falsely accused. And yet he stays calm. You know what else? Expressed a constant commitment to God regardless of how rough the road gets. Express a constant commitment to God. That phrase that's used over and over again is seen here in, in Genesis 39 in regards to Joseph. Look at this. <clears throat> Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. The warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything. The Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed. You've got to underline that in your Bible. You've got to write it down. The Lord caused everything Joseph did to succeed. Now, some of us might say, wait, sold into slavery, a slave, falsely accused, imprisoned. I mean, is that success? Yes. Because those 13 years were preparing Joseph to rule the world on God's behalf, to save the new nation of Israel, to preserve the very people that would bring Jesus into the world. Guys, what commitments are you making right now? What commitments are you making for God? You've got to make your focus his plan because then he says you will succeed in everything you do. See, a lot of people think it's this, you know, power of positive thinking or name it, claim it. Yeah, if I just say Jesus, I'm going to have a million dollar home. That's not what this is about. It's about his purposes. It's about his plan. So when you make his plans your primary focus, you can't be stopped. You cannot be defeated. 
Number five, practice kindness regardless of how I'm treated. I, I think that's something that stood out to me when I was a kid, that Joseph continued to be kind even when he was falsely accused. Look at this in Genesis 40. He's giving the dream interpretation to the baker and the cupbearer. He says, this is what the dream means, Joseph said. The three branches represent three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift you up and restore you to your position as his chief cupbearer. And please remember me and do me a favor when things go well for you. Mention me to Pharaoh so he might let me out of this place. For I was kidnapped from my homeland, the land of the Hebrews, and now I am here in prison, but I did nothing to deserve it. Look at the kindness. He doesn't say, and Pharaoh's wife is such a tramp, and that jailer was... He doesn't say that. He says, please, I've been falsely imprisoned. I've been falsely accused. You know, I, I think this has been one of the biggest tests in my life, and probably yours too. And, and kindness starts at home. Kindness starts with the people closest to you. Kindness starts with your kids who are making you appreciate their elementary school teachers. And kindness starts with the neighbor across the street that you can't get close to, but you can still love. And then it blossoms from there. Joseph was kind over and over and over again. And it has been really hitting me in the face that I need to be kind. I need to be kinder. When I think I'm kind, I need to turn it up a few notches. If you want God to bring you back from this setback to a major comeback, and you want to impact just your family or feel the impact in your life, be kind. Be kind. And finally, have faith because God's about to make things better than ever. That isn't a quote from the president or Congress. That is a quote from God. You can count on it. God is about to make things better than ever. And I don't know that that means, you know, all of a sudden your job's going to pay twice as much or you're going to get a better job or you're going to get your old job back. I just know the promise is God is going to make things better because there, with every setback, is a great comeback. And with this comeback, we are going to see God work in a powerful way. I'm just going to read this to you. Joseph's suggestions were well received by Pharaoh and his officials. So Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this man, so obviously filled with the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has revealed the meaning of the dreams to you, clearly no one else is as intelligent or wise as you. You will be in charge of my court. And all my people will take orders from you. Only I sitting on my throne will have rank higher than yours. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand and placed it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in the fine linen clothing and hung a gold chain around his neck. Then he had Joseph ride in the chariot reserved for his second in command. And wherever Joseph went, the command was shouted, kneel down. So Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all Egypt. And Pharaoh said to him, I am Pharaoh, but no one will lift a hand or foot in the entire land of Egypt without your approval. Wow. Wow. Joseph came back from all 13 years of setbacks to the greatest comeback in human history. Really, apart from Jesus rising from the dead, has there ever been a greater comeback? Uh, hey, young Jewish boy sold into slavery, young Hebrew, you're now second in command of the world. What about you? Are you going to come out of this? With the greatest comeback in your life? You can. I can. This church can, and it will. This country can, and it should. 
but it will only happen if the church rises up and doesn't feel sorry for itself, doesn't lick its wounds, but says, God, you brought me here for a reason. You know, Joseph, at the end of his life, when his father had died and his brothers lied to him, hey, uh, dad was dying and he said, please be nice to them. And he wept. He's like, guys, you don't get it. I'm kind. I'm forgiving. I love you. I brought you here to care for you. And he says this in Genesis 50, 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. Guys, God has allowed what the world says is evil, this pandemic, that somebody may have launched from a lab or it may have come from the wet markets. We don't know. It doesn't matter. It's still a spiritual attack. And God says, I've allowed it to bring good to the world. And that good can only come through the church. It can only come through people like you and I who know Jesus as our Savior. So, every comeback starts with a setback. We've had a big one. And we're about to come back. Mightier and stronger than ever. Let's just say this is it. Let's just say Jesus is going to rapture the church and the world's going to go through the tribulation and, and Jesus will come back in seven years and rule and reign with his church. Let's just say that's the case. We win. The, the worst situation becomes the best situation. Let's say God tarries for another thousand years because he says, church, get everybody the gospel. Then we got to come back with a fervor and a passion like we've never had before. Guys, we're not playing anymore. If you've been playing church or playing Christian, stop. It's time to get serious. For some of you, you're like, man, I don't even know if I'm part of the church or God's plan. Listen, God says this. Joseph was a precursor to Jesus. And just like Joseph rescued everyone, Jesus saves Everyone who believes in him. The Bible says that God so loved the world, that's you and me, that he gave sacrificially his one and only son, Jesus Christ. He died on a cross. I had a guy say to me, I don't need somebody to die for me. I said, yes, you do. I'm a good person. No, you're not. Because just like me, you're a sinner. He said he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus died 2,000 years ago. He washed away our sins. He died to save mankind. And three days later, he rose again. If right where you're at, you just say this in your mind, God, I'm a sinner. God, I've done things wrong, I admit it. And God, I don't understand all this, but I do believe that Jesus Christ died for me and I received the free gift of salvation. The Bible says in that moment, you are God's child. His spirit lives in you. You have a home in heaven. And you can never be cast out. You'll never be lost. You'll never be forsaken. So friend, put your trust in Jesus right now. And I want to pray for all of us now as we wrap up this service. We've had a setback. It's been a big one. That means it's going to be a huge comeback. Father God, thank you for these you've called into your kingdom. Thank you for salvation that comes through faith alone and Christ alone. And thank you for the story of Joseph, this amazing man, young man, who grew into his 30s as one of the greatest leaders in the world and in history. May we follow this map and come back like never before. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you came to know Jesus, text the word believe to 313131. Just text the word believe. And then if you're a guest, maybe you've never watched before or you've watched but you've never texted the guest line, same thing, 313131, text the word guest. We're gonna sing now and then I just have a few more words to share with you at the end. I love you. I can't wait to see you. Like I said, the pictures are great. If you haven't sent your pictures, send them to us. We'll tape them to the chairs. But guys, we are getting ready for the greatest comeback. Love you.